Is Donald Trump pivoting on immigration? And the Hillary Clinton email scandal continues as she lobs charges of racism at Trump. Terry Jeffrey, editor-in-chief of CNS News, joins us to handicap the race. And as the toll of historic flooding in Louisiana continues to mount, we'll bring you the latest on the recovery with Louisiana Senator David Vitter. And finally, an unlikely friendship with an elderly nun changed his life and taught him some surprising lessons. John Schlimm, author of Five Days in Heaven, is here to explain. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Terry Jeffrey, Senator David Vitter, and author John Schlimm are all straight ahead, and we have an exclusive interview you won't want to miss. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. Find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. New ethics questions are emerging for Hillary Clinton. An Associated Press investigation revealed that the Global Clinton Initiative had collected more than $300 million from dozens of individuals, private entities, and countries who had met with Clinton during her tenure as Secretary of State. According to an AP review of State Department calendars, at least 85 people from private interests had met or had phone conversations with Clinton while she led the State Department. Combined, those 85 donors gave as much as $156 million to the Clinton Initiative. At least 40 of those who met with Clinton donated more than $100,000 each, and 20 gave more than $1 million. Additionally, Clinton met with representatives from at least 16 foreign governments. They donated as much as $170 million to the Clinton charity. The AP stopped short of saying that they unearthed any clear evidence of a pay-for-play scheme, but questions remain for the presidential candidate. AP reporter Stephen Braun. Being examined, but there's clearly questions about access and clearly, clearly questions about what kind of structures and what kind of rules she, and she would put in place to make sure that you know, American voters would be satisfied both by the transparency and the limits that she would put into place uh, dealing with ethics. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump, Republican nominee, called the latest revelations about the Clinton initiative a threat to America's As foundation of democracy. He said that he's become shocked by the vast scope of Hillary Clinton's criminality, end quote. For her part, Clinton has dismissed the AP report as absurd. She told CNN on Wednesday that the report has all smoke and no fire. Meanwhile, could Donald Trump be softening his stance on immigrants in the United States illegally? During a town hall appearance in Austin, Texas on Tuesday, Trump suggested that he is open to it. When asked by moderator Sean Hannity if he would change the current law to accommodate law-abiding migrants or longtime residents who've raised children in the United States, Trump said, quote, there certainly can be a softening because we're not looking to hurt people. We want people. We have some great people in this country. He added that the laws of the country would be followed. The comments are a sharp departure from his repeated declaration that if elected, he would deport the millions living in the U.S. illegally. Though he did say early in his run for president that deportation policies needed to be done humanely. The Republican nominee said he would come out with a decision about deportations very soon. A planned immigration speech for this week was postponed. More on this and all the latest from the campaign trail in our next segment. And President Barack Obama visited Louisiana for the first-hand look at the damage from the historic floods that have claimed the lives of 13 people and forced thousands from their homes. The president toured some of the hardest-hit areas in East Baton Rouge Parish and met with families. He assured them that they are not alone and won't be. 
The U.S. bishops are calling on all American Catholics to help in the relief effort, asking for a second collection to be taken up to on September 18th. Conference President Archbishop Joseph Kurtz is encouraging the faithful to respond generously. He said, our prayer and material support is urgently needed to help rebuild lives. More on this story from Louisiana Senator David Vitter later in the show. And a terrible story coming out of Mississippi. Two Catholic nuns were found in their home dead. A Department of Public Safety spokesman said it appears the nuns were homicide victims. No motive was given, and it wasn't clear if their religious work had anything to do with the slayings. Both sisters were nurse practitioners. Sister Paula Merrill was a sister of charity of Nazareth in Kentucky, and Sister Margaret Held was a member of the School Sisters of St. Francis in Milwaukee. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the nuns and their communities. And in central Italy, emergency workers continue their rescue efforts following a 6.2 magnitude earthquake that hit the region early Wednesday morning. So far, more than 250 people are confirmed dead. The historic town of Amatrice was at the epicenter of the quake. The town has been devastated, reduced to rubble in many areas. The quake hit in the dead of night. Later that morning, at his general audience, Pope Francis led the faithful in a rosary for the quake victims, assuring all of his prayers. The quake struck near Norcia, the birthplace of St. Benedict, and the home of the Benedictine monks of Norcia. For more, I'm joined from Rome by the prior of the Monastery of St. Benedict, Father Cashin Folsom. Father Cashin, thank you for being with us. Give me a sense of the state of your monastery, the basilica there in Norcia, the birthplace of St. Benedict, and the town surrounding it. Well, uh, the earthquake, thanks be to God, didn't take the lives of any of the people in town, and the monks are safe and sound, and that's the most important thing. But extensive damage has been done uh, both to the monastery and to the basilica. We're guessing that the basilica will be closed for a year. Uh, the monastery, we're still waiting. We, we can't, um, we can't uh, stay in the monastery, so we had to take refuge uh, at the Benedictine University in Rome uh, because uh, there's, there's danger of, uh, well, it's dangerous to be in the monastery. So we're waiting for official inspection uh, to determine what is structural damage and what is simply superficial damage. You do have a monk staying there, though, uh, as an act of solidarity with the people, as well as to, I imagine, keep an eye on the, on the monastery, correct? Well, we have two monks staying up there, but they're sleeping in tents outside. It's precisely to, um, to be with the townspeople and to keep an eye on the place, just as you said. The, but the structure is very weakened. I know you have been doing extensive renovations, and we're seeing video of uh, the basilica as it was. You'd been uh, renovating the side chapels and, and other parts of the monastery. Is all of that ruined, Father? Uh, no. The, um, the trouble is we can't do an accurate uh, uh, survey of those things uh, because we can't uh, stay in the building. So we have to wait for it. See, there have been tremors, and, and it's not just been one earthquake, but several, uh, and continuous tremors. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, by tomorrow things will calm down enough so that we can do an, an actual, a careful analysis of, of the damage that has been done. An example, however, in the refectory of the monastery, where uh, some beautiful paintings have been, have been done, uh, there's various parts that have chipped off, but it, there's no structural damage there. In the basilica, uh, the, the altar of St. Benedict, uh, the, the stone behind the altar uh, pushed through and, uh, and uh, hurtled to the ground, uh, along with all kinds of stucco, and uh, that's, uh, that will need extensive repair. The side altars that we've been repairing, um, we're not, it seems that the side altars themselves are okay, but the structures around it are um, sagging. We're not quite sure how it's all going to turn out. Father, how are you and the community doing emotionally? I know interviewing survivors of the Louisiana floods, having gone through Katrina myself, it does take an emotional toll on you. 
Well, some, some of the monks have been a little bit traumatized by it. Um, their, their first experience of, a, of an earthquake, and it takes a lot of emotional energy, certainly. Um, but, of course, we are fortified by faith, and uh, we know that it, we're, we're in God's hands, and it's uh, His providence, and things will, things will work out the way they're supposed to. Um, the main thing, and I'm extremely grateful, is that all the monks are safe. Well, we are certainly grateful for that as well. And uh, Father Cash and Folsom, we will put up uh, an email address where people can help. Know that our prayers are with you and the friars and all those in Orsha and the surrounding areas in central Italy. It's a horrible thing to behold. Uh, I did have an email. I've got to ask you this. Uh, some of your fans, those who drink your beer, uh, the uh, beer inertia, they, they are asking, what's the state of the brewery? Well, thanks be to God, it's intact. The, the, the um, fermenters did move a bit uh, in the earthquake, and that's a good thing because if they had stayed, they're not fixed to the floor. And if they had been fixed, they could have uh, burst. But as it is, that's intact. Uh, and we're waiting to, to go back and make sure that all the pipes are uh, in good order. Uh, but it seems that, uh, that the brewery is, is, uh, hasn't suffered any damage. Good. Father Cashin, thank you so much for being with us. Godspeed, and we'll check in with you in the days ahead. You can help the Benedictine monks of Norcia in their recovery efforts by visiting their website at nursia, N U R S I A dot org. And the monks remain the best selling classical artists of the year. Their latest CD, Benedicta, Marian Chant from Norcia, is also available at their website at nursia.com, at Amazon, and at the EWTN Religious Catalog. The music and their Bira Nursia beer are the monks' sole sources of income, so do support them if you can. And the European Union's counterterrorism agency has intercepted fake passports destined for alleged ISIS members hidden among the Middle Eastern refugees in Greece. The Italian daily La Stampa is reporting that officials from Europol investigated the trafficking of fake documents from Iraq and Syria into Greece and Austria. Many of the fake passports were destined for refugee camps in Greece. The report comes amid renewed concerns over the wave of new migrants into Greece this week. Some 58,000 migrants have landed in Greece since February. Meanwhile, France is fighting against the Islamicization of its country as a growing number of resort towns are banning the so-called burkini swimsuit. Political leaders there are arguing that the body-covering swimwear resembling a full-length, loose-fitting wetsuit with a hood oppresses women and that it violates France's secular principles. On French television, Prime Minister Manuel Valls said the burkini is a symbol of women enslavement. It's a vision of women that we have to fight against." End quote. The new law is being enforced. In Nice, police were seen instructing a Muslim woman to remove her burkini. The creator of the burkini says all of the controversy has spiked her sales. And a major abortion provider in England has temporarily suspended some of its operations following surprise inspections that uncovered safety concerns. Marie Stopes International announced that it would stop performing abortions across the UK on minors and other vulnerable groups of women. The Care Quality Commission in Britain found problems with consent as well as unsafe conditions in the clinics. Marie Stopes International performs over 70,000 abortions a year in the UK. And a recent Pew Research survey of religious faith in America has uncovered some surprising data. Pew says the number of Americans claiming no religion, the nons, has increased from 16 percent to nearly 25 percent in just under a decade. Almost 80 percent of the adults who identify with no religion say they abandoned the faith of their childhood once they came of age. At the same time, the study found that 51% of Americans now attend church regularly. 49% hardly attend at all. 
And a federal judge in Texas has temporarily blocked the Obama administration's directive requiring school districts to allow transgender students to use restrooms corresponding to their chosen gender identity. In his ruling, District Judge Reed O'Connor indicated that federal agencies overstepped their authority under a 1972 law banning sex discrimination in schools. The injunction applies nationwide and is at least the third legal setback to the Obama administration's transgender directive for public schools. The Justice Department lamented the decision and is currently reviewing its options in response. You've heard me here talk about my Will Wilder series and a certain stolen relic that inspired it. Sadly, this next story is not fiction. In San Francisco, a relic believed to be a fragment of the true cross of Christ was snatched this week. The relic seen here at the very center of the photo was taken from its locked reliquary at St. Dominic Church. The church has no security cameras and there were no witnesses to the theft. Church pastor Father Michael Hurley told Catholic News Agency that the relic is very much part of the devotional life of the parish and said he was hopeful that the thief would come to understand how much the relic means to the faithful there and return it. I told you this stuff happens. And with the school year beginning, I'm giving away some brand new audio books. They were just released, and I'll announce the contest on next week's show. But if you sign up for my free e-blast at RaymondArroyo.com, you'll get the first notice of the contest. So sign up for the e-blast and stay tuned for your chance to win some incredible audio books for the whole family. When we return, Donald Trump signals a more moderate tone on immigration, or does he? Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton's email scandal continues to unfold. Terry Jeffrey of CNS News joins us to put it all in perspective. The world over continues in a moment. Stay right there. From the start, Donald Trump has built his campaign on prejudice and paranoia. He is taking hate groups mainstream and helping a radical fringe take over the Republican Party. Hillary Clinton is a bigot who sees people of color only as votes not as human beings worthy of a better future. Back to the world over. You just heard Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump going after each other this week. Donald Trump caused a firestorm when he appeared to shift to a more moderate position on immigration reform, but did he really? And Hillary Clinton's newly released emails seem to indicate influence peddling while she hits Trump with new charges of racism, and he hits back. Here to make sense of it all is editor-in-chief of CNS News, Terry Jeffrey. Terry, thanks for your willingness to come in and <laughs> try to unpack this crazy week. I want to play this for you. All week, Hillary Clinton has been tarring Trump as a racist. She gave voice to those charges at a rally in Nevada on Thursday. Watch. Trump is reinforcing harmful stereotypes and offering a dog whistle to his most hateful supporters. It's a disturbing preview of what kind of president he'd be. And that's what I want to make clear today. A man with a long history of racial discrimination who traffics in dark conspiracy theories drawn from the pages of supermarket tabloids and the far dark reaches of the internet. Well, Donald Trump wasn't going to sit still for that. He responded preemptively at his own rally. It's a movement, folks, like they've never seen before. And going to accuse decent Americans who support this campaign, your campaign, of being racists, which we're not. 
It's the oldest play in the Democratic playbook. Terry Jeffrey, does this work on any level? I mean, we have both of them charging the other with being racist. Raymond, I, I thought that one of the problems with Donald Trump's campaign in the primaries was his routine resort to ad hominem arguments and insulting his opponents mm -hmm. and trying to label them with, you know, absurd nicknames that mm -hmm. insulted them. Now we have Hillary Clinton doing the same thing. And in a, in a period in American history, we're very profound, fundamental questions about the future of our country, about whether we are going to be a free country, whether fundamental things like the right to life and religious liberty are going to be preserved or destroyed in this country are at stake. We have this kind of debate. Mm. And I, don't, I think the country deserves a better debate, and I think they need to understand. I think, I think the Republican candidate needs to articulate the things that are really at stake when this election comes down. And you want to talk about real issues with Hillary Clinton. This is a lady who believes that it ought to be legal under all circumstances to deliberately take the life of an innocent human being in, in the womb. She's completely 100 percent about abortion. That's one thing this campaign is about. She also was a part of the Obama administration and has supported Obamacare, which, as you know, includes this regulation that forces people to purchase health insurance plans that include sterilizations, contraceptives, and abortion-inducing drugs. They took the Little Sisters of the Poor, the Diocese of Pittsburgh, the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., multiple other Catholic institutions, all the way to the United States Supreme Court to try and enforce that point. Right now, for example, there's a case coming up through the federal courts of a family in Missouri who says, why should we as a family have to buy a health insurance plan that would provide an abortifacient to our our daughters. These are the issues that are at stake, fundamental issues at stake. The country deserves a debate on those. Mm. We saw Donald Trump this week, though, not talking about those issues, and neither is Hillary Clinton. He's trying to pivot and reach out to these minority communities. He met with Hispanic and African American leaders this week. Clearly, Hillary Clinton is trying to cut him off at the pass by saying, wait a minute, you've already said these inflammatory things, and therefore, you can't, you can't reach this community. It'll never be bought. You'd say what? Well, first of all, I think it's a good thing for Donald Trump to reach out to and campaign in all communities in the United States mm -hmm. of America. We're one nation. He ought to treat us as one nation. And I think there's a false argument that's been made against some of the things that Trump's done, leaving his rhetoric aside. The question is, is it just for the government of the United States to enforce the border of the United States? The border of the United States is a just law. It's only a just thing to do it. I would argue that people in the federal government have a duty to enforce our borders. Mm. What about the immigration and work laws within the United States of America? Is it a just thing for our government to enforce the actual laws we have about work and immigration in the United States of America. Of course it is. And there are many good people who are victims of the fact that our government refuses to do that. Should Donald Trump continue to make that argument? I believe yes. Should he use good rhetoric when he does it? Yes. Mm. Should he engage Hillary Clinton on that issue? Yes. Should Hillary Clinton come back with answers about what her policies are? Yes. Well, you saw a little earlier, and, and we're going to get to the story that Trump may have stepped on by talking immigration this week, but with Sean Hannity at this town hall meeting, he said that he's open to a softening, that he's willing to work with people. He doesn't want to hurt these people, meaning those who are here illegally. Was, is that the right timing? Never mind the message of that. Is the timing right, A, because it stepped on the Hillary Clinton email dump that the AP, the report by the AP that we, we shared with you earlier, uh, and at the same time, many of his supporters say, wait a minute, you're flip-flopping on us. Well, I think it does confuse people, and I don't, I don't think that uh, anything Donald Trump's going to say on that is necessarily going to be translated accurately by the liberal mm -hmm. press. But I think there is, look, you know, it's a lot of people say there's 11 million illegal aliens in the country. Are you going to deport them all? But that is not what the government needs to do. What the government needs to do is enforce the law against people who are hiring illegal aliens in this country. Mm. And, 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 and think about the justice there. If you're a legal resident of the United States who's legally immigrated to the United States, or you're a citizen of the United States, and you're looking for a job and you're trying to make a decent wage, and someone illegally enters the United States and uses as a fraudulent or a stolen Social Security number to get a job, is the government treating you justly by allowing that person 
person who's come here illegally to compete with you for wages and a job? Do you have a right to have a government that actually enforces the law that you obey, that the legal immigrant obeys, in order to give an advantage to someone who came here illegally and is flouting the law? Mm -hmm. I, I think justice means the government enforces that law, and I think that is justice for the legal immigrant, it's justice for the citizen, and I think justice for the illegal immigrant is for that person to realize they're breaking the law and go home. Mm. I want to share this with you. This is a rally in New Hampshire on Thursday. Donald Trump had this to say about the way Hillary Clinton used her office when she was Secretary of State. Watch. Just imagine the damage to our security, to our integrity, to our standing in the world. And believe me, the world is laughing as they watch. If Hillary Clinton is allowed to sell the Oval Office in the same way she sold her office as Secretary of State. Does this move the needle for him, or did Trump step on his own story with the immigration, seem the softening on immigration story? Well, I, I think clearly he didn't have a he didn't have a clear and forceful message there. I think the story that the Associated Press did, connecting the people who met with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State and those who talked with her, with making contributions to uh, the Clinton uh, Foundation, raises, raises huge questions. That was an excellent piece of journalism, mm -hmm. and it raises huge questions. This is a person whose job was to look out for the interests of the United States of America and its relations with other nations, and she's meeting with people who have other interests that gave money to her family's foundation. I think there's huge questions there that need to be answered. Do you think it's a pay-for-play scandal? Do well, you think it's a pay-for-play scheme? Uh, well, no. I, look, I, I don't think that you can jump to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, But I do think it is something that, it, 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 obviously, there's an appearance of a conflict of interest. And whether there was an actual problem where, you know, what you're saying, that's something that needs to be investigated. And I, I think part of the problem we had with uh, what the Justice Department did is you had the Obama Justice Department investigating his own Secretary of State rather than having an independent counsel do it. If you're going to have that kind of investigation, I believe, it needs to be done by an independent counsel who can come to an independent conclusion and, and let the American people know that justice was truly served. I want to share these latest polls with you in our remaining moments. Uh, the new Quinnipiac poll taken between the 18th and the 24th. Clinton is up 10 points nationally. The LA Times poll sees it as a tie nationally. Right. Uh, real clear average, uh, uh, real clear politics average, Clinton is up six points. What do these polls mean now? Are opinions cementing, Terry Jeff? Uh, the, the election's not over. I think either one of these candidates can win. And I think the national polls aren't the most important thing. Mm -hmm. As we saw in 2000, Al Gore got the popular vote. He didn't yep. win the election. What matters is the Electoral College. And there's key states. Ohio is a crucial state. Florida is a crucial state. I think in this election, Michigan is a crucial yep. state. Pennsylvania is a crucial state. It can't, it, it, so, so the candidate that wins those states is going to win the election. Those states are still up for grabs, so this election is still open. Mm. Terry Jeffrey, we will be in touch with you in the coming days. Thanks so much. Be sure to follow Terry Jeffrey's columns and analysis at cnsnews.com. When we return, the recovery in central and southern Louisiana continues. What is the current state of those relief efforts, and what is the federal government doing? Is it enough? Louisiana Senator David Vitter will tell us when the world over continues. Stay right there. We're trying to get out, save all their clothes as much as we can out of there and all their, their belongings and try to get it out of here. Get it all uh, washed up for them. Uh, they, lost, they lost everything. They had 23 inches of water in their house. Total loss. Total loss, total chaos, soaking wet, books everywhere, floating, half of it floated out of the house. Uh, oh none of their, none of the kids' comfort things either. They, they just, everything is uncertain. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Those were a couple of folks in Ascension Parish in Louisiana 
describing the devastation of this historic flooding that has caused such mayhem throughout the state over the last week. 100,000 plus people have filed for federal assistance, over 60,000 homes damaged. Joining me now to discuss the extent of that damage and what the road to recovery might look like in the next weeks and months ahead is Louisiana Senator David Vitter. Senator Vitter, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks, now, thanks for having me. Thanks for shining a light on this important story. Well, you know, it's gotten so little attention nationally, even with the presidential and, and right. uh, uh, Trump visiting. I want to play people uh, when the president arrived on Tuesday, what he had to say. Listen. What I want the people of Louisiana to know is that you're not alone on this. Even after the TV cameras leave, uh, the whole country is going to continue to s support you and help you until we get uh, folks back in their homes and lives are rebuilt. Senator Vitter, what has the response been from the government? I know during Katrina it was uh, hit and miss and there was a lot of dislocation. What's happening this time around? Well, it's been pretty good, but it's just beginning. As the president suggested, this is the long haul. This recovery is going to take months and even years. And so the key is that we stay focused on it for as long as it takes for a full recovery. So it's really just beginning. But the immediate response has been adequate, uh, and we're building on that. Mm -hmm. I want to play this. Uh, the president went on during those public comments. He went on a little tour, went through a few homes. He had this to say. When we have a better sense of uh, how much infrastructure has been damaged, what more we need to do in terms of mitigation strategies, that's when Congress, I think, may be called upon uh, to do some more. Now, the good news is, is that you got four members of Congress right here, uh, and uh, uh, a number of them happen to be in the majority. So uh, I suspect that you know they they may be able to uh, talk to the Speaker and talk to Mitch McConnell. Senator Vitter, what is your message going to be when you get back to the Capitol? Well, we are going to do that. We're tallying up the damage right now. We're tallying up exactly what we'll need for a full and adequate recovery. And then there will be some appropriate federal response. It's going to take presidential leadership. We saw in Katrina and Rita, other hurricanes, other events, that major aid only happens when the president leads. In that case, it was Bush. Now it has to be President Obama. So it's going to take that presidential leadership. But certainly our congressional delegation on a bipartisan basis is going to be actively involved to support that getting through the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Vitter, it took the president almost two weeks to get down there to Louisiana. To Was that a mistake and did that hurt the efforts here and focusing national attention? Well, I wish it had happened sooner, but at least it happened recently. Uh, it did bring a big national spotlight, which was not on this story before. And this is a major event, Raymond. This is a literally a thousand year flood event. Hmm. The number of homes flooded will probably go over 100,000. It's a big, big event. And in terms of national coverage, it has not been commensurate with that event. When the president finally did come in, that did bring the media spotlight, which was positive. And that really started when Donald Trump came in the week before. Yeah, and I'll play a bite of that in a moment. I, I want to stay on this issue of the, the federal response, what can be done, and more importantly, what are you seeing on the ground? You know, there is that story of uh, that I'm getting from cousins and friends in the area where you've had neighbors come together, right. black neighbors, white neighbors, neighbors who never had never met before, and they're all Absolutely. kind of pulling together. Tell me what you're saying. Yeah. Well, Raymond, look, there needs to be a federal response and a government response, but the immediate response is the person-to-person -person response, the neighbor response that you're talking about. You're from Louisiana. You know what it's like. And that spirit has really come through in an extremely positive way. I'll give you two examples. One is the so-called Cajun Navy, and that just means hunters and fishermen and outdoorsmen getting out their boats and literally going into the floodwaters immediately to rescue neighbors when necessary. That was in full force over the last uh, two weeks, and thousands of people were literally rescued that way. Second example I observed yesterday when I was touring with the president in a devastated 
neighborhood in greater Baton Rouge, there was one elderly woman who lived alone. She had lost her daughter several months before. She was all alone, obviously a very difficult situation for an elderly woman who lives alone. But one of her neighbors was coming over to help her uh, rip out sheet rock. He had his own house to tend to with his family, but this young black guy did that and helped his neighbor as well. No, you, you, there are so many beautiful human stories in this tragedy, and they're coming forward every day. And in the wake of the shooting in, in Baton Rouge, some are saying this is almost, uh, you know, a divine restorative, that it somehow brought the community together and that this is what it took to shake everybody to their essentials and make them realize, you know, you're in this together. Right, absolutely. Certainly no one would have wished this on Greater Baton Rouge yeah. or any other part of the country or the world. But it has brought folks together. Uh, that Louise, positive Louisiana spirit, Neighbors mm -hmm. Helping Neighbors, has come to the fore. There are literally thousands of stories like the two I just recounted. And so it has been somewhat of a, a healing process for Greater Baton Rouge. Senator Vitter, you chair the Small Business uh, Committee in the Senate, and uh, you brought together today right. some of those officials from, from HUD, uh, the, the administrator of the Small Business Administration. Tell me what that meeting was about and the importance of that in the midst of this tragedy. Yeah, I invited and got on the ground today in the devastated area the administrator of SBA, and also the secretary of HUD. I think it's really important that they, just like the president a few days ago, see firsthand on the ground exactly what's going on. The small business devastation is major. By some counts, up to 60% of small businesses that are flooded like this fail in the next year. We want to avoid that. We want to bring every SBA and other resource possible to the fore to help small business recover because that's going to, in large part, be the metric of a, a full-scale economic and, and social recovery. Mm -hmm. So it was very positive that the administrator saw things firsthand and knows what SBA tools to bring forward to help in the response. Same thing with the HUD secretary. Mm -hmm. Housing is a huge issue. CDBG funds, other housing funds will be very important. Yeah, people don't realize the scope of the devastation and the paperwork involved. I mean, we went through Katrina, and the and the the, the just the yeah. bureaucracy is overwhelming to someone who's trying to yeah. rebuild their life, keep their kids in school. Uh, any any attempts to streamline that process and make those barriers, you know, the matching funds that you have to have to receive federal assistance to lower some of those matching funds, et cetera. Well, certainly my staff and I are trying to break through that red tape all the time. Mm -hmm. And folks can come to our website. It's a good place to start, vitter.senate.gov, G-O-V, vitter.senate.gov. All the main portals, all the main categories are there, SBA, uh, HUD, uh, Small Business Administration, uh, I mentioned that, FEMA, mm -hmm. all of that. So that's a good place to start. In terms of matching funds and other hurdles, we're also trying to reduce that. The governor has already requested that the 25% match be lowered to at least 10%, if not to zero, and I'm very hopeful that that's going to happen. I want to play something for you. This is uh, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. He first arrived on the scene last Friday on August 19th. He had this to say. It's a great place. I've had a, a great history with Louisiana. They need a lot of help. What's happened here is incredible. Nobody understands how bad it is. It's really incredible. So I'm just here to help. Was that the appropriate response, Dave Vitter? And how was that received by the people of Louisiana? It was very appropriate. It was received very well. Uh, first of all, he came in with real concrete aid and a major contribution to the relief effort. Mm -hmm. So that was certainly appreciated. Secondly, he brought the national media with him, which was not here covering the story in any sort of adequate way. And quite frankly, that led to President Obama's visit and a lot mm -hmm. more national attention. So it was very positive in that aspect as well. Uh, Senator Vitter, there's, uh, amazingly, the Red Cross donations are low. They're just not coming in. To what do you attribute that? Is that, is that because of the uh, sort of non-existent media coverage of this until this week, really? You know, Raymond, I'm not sure. I think it is because of the um, uh, inadequate media coverage. I think a lot of Americans are probably somewhat disaster-wary 
because unfortunately we've had a number of these events around the country back to back. And there are a lot of competing stories. The economy is not super. So I think all of that has mm -hmm. added up to a less than adequate response into the coffers of the Red Cross. But I certainly want to encourage anybody who feels inclined to do that to help the Red Cross. They're on the ground. You can also volunteer personal time if you're here on the ground. You can go yep. to uh, volunteerlouisiana.gov and find plenty of opportunities to do that if you want to donate your time rather than just money. Yeah, no, and it, we've seen an incredible reaction uh, from people all over the state and adjoining states coming in and helping people in this moment of need. Uh, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton issued a statement on why she has not yet visited Louisiana. She said, this month's floods in Louisiana are a crisis that demand a national response. I'm committed to visiting communities affected by these floods at a time when the presence of a political campaign will not disrupt the response to discuss how we can and will rebuild together. Now, Louisiana is predominantly a red state. Uh, how did this response play, Senator Vitter? Well, not too well. Uh, I think her visit would be most welcome. I think it would be important. It would bring the media back. It would bring that spotlight back. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be very productive, and I'm sorry it hasn't happened. All right, we'll leave it there. Anything else you would like to add that we aren't hearing? of this situation, something you saw that well, stuck out I, I, I just, Well, again, the human response, the positive coming together, the neighbor helping neighbor, mm -hmm. has really been very overwhelming and very positive. If there's mm -hmm. any silver lining in this negative story, that is it. And that includes a lot of folks around the country mm -hmm. who have helped by donating, by in some cases coming here personally, many of your audience members. So we yeah. all really appreciate that. Very good. Senator David Vitter, thank you for being with us. And we'll certainly keep an eye on this and be in touch. Thank you very much, Raymond. If you would like to help the people of Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas hit so hard by these recent floods, Lake Charles, uh, Livingston, I mean, it, it is really stretched across the, the middle of the state. You can donate to the American Red Cross. Go to redcross.org. You can also still give to the Diocese of Baton Rouge Disaster Assistance Fund. Visit the diocesan website at D-I-O-B-R dot org. When we return, an inspiring story of friendship and redemption. Author John Schlimm is here to discuss his new memoir, Five Years in Heaven, when the World Over Live returns. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. What could an 87-year-old Benedictine nun possibly teach a 31-year-old self-described lost soul? My next guest is no longer lost, but he's here to tell us about his unusual friendship with Sister Augustine, a humble ceramic artist who lived in a monastery near his hometown. Over a period of five years, their visits taught him invaluable lessons about life love, mercy, and redemption. He's the author of the new memoir, Five Years in Heaven, The Unlikely Friendship That Answered Life's Greatest Questions. I sat down with John Schlimm to discuss it all recently here in our D.C. studio. John, first of all, where and how <laughs> did you meet Sister Augustine, this, this woman who you knew for five years, and she really transformed your life. It really was a case of divine intervention, if ever there was one. You know, I met her at a point in my life when I was at one of those crossroads we all get to, where we're wondering if we've made the right decisions and we're going in the right direction. And on a very snowy February 21st, I still remember the date, mm -hmm. uh, I was taken to her ceramic shop on the grounds of uh, the convent in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met her. Wow. And you thought what when you met her? This there, is an aged nun. She was, what, 87 She was 87. Old. I was 31 at the time. She was 87, 87. And I walked into that shop. You know, there was this little nun in full traditional habit, uh, barely over five feet tall, slightly hunched. Uh, the only deviation from the habit was she had on a homemade bib apron smeared with paint. Yeah. And it really was just a magical moment. And I knew I had walked into the place I was meant to be at that huh. point. In my and life. what did she teach you? What was the enduring lesson she gave you over those five years? You know, over those five years, I spent hundreds of visits with her. Every week, I would go one or two times. 
and I once asked her, we were making these little leftover, these little crosses that she made from leftover clay, and I asked her, sister, in your life, what is the most important lesson you've learned? Huh. And it sort of it gave her pause, and she sat down and thought for a moment, and then she said a single word, forgiveness. Hmm. And that really became the focus of chapter six in the book, Tiny Crosses, because mm -hmm. that then turned into this conversation about the importance of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And there's not a day that goes by that that lesson in particular isn't something that you know, crosses my mind. Why did you write the book? Why did you feel? I know, you know books are not easy to write, um, particularly as they are the closer they are to you, the harder they are to write in some ways, because they demand Absolutely. a lot of you. And this was a book that almost didn't get written. And if huh. people jump to the acknowledgments in the back... Uh, first, you waited a long I, time to write I it. tell the story of how it came to be, and it was through mm -hmm. a very special sign that I received from Sister. Mm -hmm. But I felt that, you know, Sister always talked about God's time and how God's mm -hmm. time is different than our... Because I would always be so impatient, like, yeah. why can't I find the job I want? Why, yeah. you know, are publishers rejecting every book? proposal I send mm -hmm. to them and she would say in God's time this will happen and I really think this is a case with this book it just it came at the right time and in God's time I was able to write it mm. uh, you know uh, as I was reading five years in heaven uh, and, I, and I just read it after mother Angelica's passing who also died on Easter Sunday at 92 yes isn't that amazing which was, you're, you know <laughs> sister Augustine has the same experience same thing um, you thought what when she passed you all had you exchanged words at the end and you almost it's almost as if you're trying to tell her Hey, hang around. Don't don't leave us. You got all this work to do. You're, yes. you're trying to keep her. And she tells you what? She told me, I said I asked her once, Sister, are you afraid of dying? Because she was really the last in her immediate family, some of whom had died very tragically. Mm. And I said, Are you afraid of dying? And she said, No, everyone's entitled to their reward. Hmm. And so when she passed away, and I was the last person to get to actually visit with her, hmm. at, which was such a great honor. And so when I heard the news that she had passed on Easter Sunday, hmm. I just looked up at the sky and I smiled and I thought, you got your reward. Hmm. You, you are part, what, what, the interesting thing here is it really is also about uh, the enduring power of art in a life and, and how through art, whatever that art might be, in her case, it was ceramics. She, she had this ceramic shop, and you brought me one of her little ceramic crosses here, beautiful. Um, talk to me about what she imparted to you about the importance of art, whatever it is, in our lives, and how it's inspired you. You have your own projects now that are ongoing. Yes, she really taught me that life is art. Our lives are the greatest work of art. Mm -hmm. You know, we really, everything we do, the joys and the sorrows, she taught me to embrace everything and really to look at those things as the paintbrush to our canvas and the chisel to our block of marble. Mm -hmm. And so she really expanded my concept of just what art and life truly are. Uh, tell me about this, this uh, project you have, The Smile That Changed the World. What is this? <laughs> I'm so excited about The Smile That Changed the World is yours. It's a particular participatory art piece. It's this 18-foot long canvas of faces that I've started, and then I invite the participants to come up and add uh, their mm -hmm. smiles to it. Uh, but it's been really great to see uh, just all the different people who have come to this project. You know, it'll be everyone from a three-year-old child to someone in their 80s and 90s who will come up and they'll, they'll pick their favorite color and they'll add their smile to the canvas. Mm. And it's been such a joy to see that. Uh, when you wrote Five Years in Heaven, when I went through it, um, my, the thing that kept coming back to me is we, as Pope Francis has said, we treat the elderly as if they're garbage or disposable trash. And there are these rich vessels of wisdom, love, hope, experience that really we need to go on, on Absolutely. our journey. Absolutely. What did the experience with Sister Augustine teach you and what do we need to take from that, the time you spent with her after you met? Well, you know, we were separated in age by 56 years. Mm. And going into my friendship with her, I had been fortunate to be close with grandparents and great uncles mm. and aunts. And so my parents had already instilled a great respect for older people. Uh, but she really cemented that. And she just showed me the beauty that comes in those relationships on both ends and how we really are all uh, both teacher and student in ever reversing roles. And, you know, I, Pope Francis, of course, is so wonderful, as was Mother Angelica. And 
would like to think that the three of them would have been great friends. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sure Mother Angelica and Sister Augustine are having yeah. a great time they're, right now. Indeed. Hopefully they're smiling down on you and me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope so, too. And the book certainly made me smile. It's a beautiful book, Five Years in Heaven, The Unlikely Friendship That Answered Life's Greatest Questions. John, thank you so much. Oh, for thank being you for here. having what me. What a pleasure. Five Years in Heaven, The Unlikely Friendship That Answered Life's Greatest Questions by John Schlimm is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Remember to sign up for my free e-blast at RaymondArroyo.com and I'll email you info on our audiobook contest, free Will Wilder and Mother Angelica audiobooks. What could be better for your commute? Well, that's all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Next week, Dick Morris joins us to talk presidential politics, and Mother Teresa's postulator will be here to discuss her cause for canonization. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.